we will pray. Okay, recording is on. Let's pray and start. Mangi, would you like to pray? Uh, yes, Father. I will pray. Yes. Um, okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and your your, your great love, Lord. We mm. thank you for giving us opportunity, Lord, to come and learn and complete this class of apol apologetics again. We, you have been faithful and you, you've given us knowledge and enough information, Lord, to be able to, to defend you, Lord, in the world. And we pray, Jesus, as we, we conclude this class, King, let this seed be planted in our heart. And empower Pastor Shish as he close the class. And as you prepare for the next time, Lord, be with him and give him knowledge and wisdom, Lord, on how to go about it and what's the right things to do. We pray all this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again. Today is our final session on uh, Christian apologetics. Uh, what I want to do is uh, just uh, kind of do a quick overview of all the main topics that we have covered in the course. And then uh, just open it up for time of questions, discussion, uh, anything you feel uh, we would need to discuss and so on. And, uh, and we'll see how that goes. You know, if we finish in an hour, that's fine. If we spills over into our second hour, we'll just continue uh, of uh, continue the questions and interaction for the second hour as well. So <clears throat> just to quickly review, uh, review and uh, get an overview of uh, this course. Um, I'll maybe just share the table of contents, I think. Let me just see. Now. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me just share this. All right. So I'm just sharing the table of contents uh, of the notes there, uh, which uh, you know I've been I gave out uh, in pieces. Um, so basically, in chapter one, uh, the very first lecture, first few lectures, uh, we uh, positioned what the course that we are teaching on, on apologetics as both something that we reason, uh, we uh, we engage in meaningful discussion. And we also demonstrate that as we believe in the supernatural power of God, uh, which many times is, is you know, it's, it just addresses the issues and so on. Um, so that even when things we don't answer, when people encounter the power of God, uh, they know that God is real. So in apologetics, we are basically saying we are giving a reason for what we believe, explaining to others why we believe what we believe. And so we started off uh, going through, you know, a series of questions on the existence of God, uh, creation, and uh, 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 existence of God and creation. So a lot of questions on that. So we uh, spent one lesson on the existence of God, that the fact that, you know, we give reasons why we believe God exists. We talked about science and faith, that... Uh, these are actually not contradictory. You can be a person of faith in God and still be a very good scientist. And uh, while science is good, there are a lot of things that science is unable to answer, which faith sheds light on and helps us understand. We talked about creation and, uh, you know, we had looked at Genesis 1. We saw the six days of creation. These are little six days of creation and uh, the underlying theme or thought we emphasized was that in the creative act of God, 
in his crate, in, in the crate act yoga, the time and energy were compressed. So uh, that means uh, uh, God didn't need as much time as we think, you know, uh, as evolution would suggest. Or and uh, you know, uh, God is so powerful in His creative act. Time and energy were compressed, and creation came into existence. So we spoke about that, and we took address some common questions around creation. Then we took some time to look at uh, evolutionary biology and also on uh, the Big Bang Theory. Uh, we said, okay, this is what you know evolutionary biology presents, but here are questions that remain unanswered uh, by evolutionary biology, and these are the gaps. Similarly with the Big Bang Theory, this is what they postulate, but here are the gaps. Here are things that uh, so far in physics and uh, uh, astrophysics and so on. We've not been able to uh, answer those questions. So we spent a lot of time, I think, in the early part of the course, a lot of lectures on that basic God, creation, science, uh, evolution, and cosmology. Then we shifted focus. We started talking about the Bible, uh, that uh, the Bible is... Uh, uh, why do we say the Bible is authentic and accurate? So we just went through all the practical uh, things that uh, show us how accurate the Bible is uh, and uh, uh, the scriptures. Uh, and there will always be people who will try to dispute and argue, but the fact is, uh, in terms of ancient literature, uh, the Bible is uh, the most authentic and most reliable text that we that we have, given the number of manuscripts, the time gap, and the the uh, diligence with which things have been uh, transmitted to us. Then, after we talked to the Bible, then we turned to the the focus on uh, the person of Jesus Christ. Things around that. So we talked about the uniqueness of Christ. Why is Christ unique? Why do we say he is the only way of salvation? Then we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. And, you know, we can just see uh, just by the whole, um, uh, the, the narrative of the whole incident of his resurrection that it cannot be manufactured. It, it's not a hoax. It's a real thing that happened, the physical res resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, the subsequent years and the, the transformation of a man like Saul and so on. These, these are real things you cannot deny. And uh, so Jesus Christ is alive. Then we uh, took a little bit of time to talk about, you know, the presenting the message of salvation, uh, especially to uh, people of other faiths. So we uh, uh, talked about, uh, what is that? Uh, um, salvation in Jesus Christ, and some basic guidelines of sharing Christ with a Hindu and a Muslim. So we, um, we focused on that. So uh, the, message, the fact that the Bible presents salvation as only in the person of Christ. So when you look at the Bible, uh, there is no other uh, option for salvation. It's in the person of Christ. And how do we present this to a Hindu or a Muslim? Now we didn't. We did not spend uh, time on these two things: worldview, other worldviews, and contemporary cults. Um, I didn't want to spend time on that. Uh, instead, we went directly to uh, responding to social challenges, and we spent time on understanding suffering. So, um, actually, we did understanding suffering first. So, we spent time talking about suffering uh, from a biblical perspective. So, we put before us all the reasons why, uh, from a biblical perspective, people experience suffering. Uh, none of these things, and, and all of these, let me put it like this, all of these things have to be understood from God's original intent. That God's heart for people is always good. He created and he put things in place that were good. But then why is there suffering? And we, we presented several reasons, biblical reasons, why there is suffering and how uh, believers should respond to suffering. And then lastly, we talked about these uh, 
social challenges. That, um, uh, you know, the, the church is facing uh, uh, or has to respond to a number of social challenges and has to be the pillar and upholder of truth in society. We can't run away from it. God has said that the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. So we have to respond to so many of these challenges now uh, because these actually, uh, you know, um, uh, question some of the, or challenge some of the things that the church is supposed to uphold in society, right from the idea of marriage and uh, uh, homosexuality and uh, then divorce. Well, what is the church's stand on that? What does the church stand on abortion? What does the church stand on climate change? What is it and the environment? What does the church stand on uh, other um, areas of science? Like, and we just uh, took a little bit of time to talk about uh, genetic uh, genetics and genetic engineering and modification of genes and so on. So uh, there's just a little representative, if you're not obviously addressing all the social challenges that are there, but just as a representation, we need to have a little framework in our minds on how we're going to respond to it. And what I uh, try to present there is, you know, understand how God responds. How, do, how does God deal with these things, right? Uh, he's fair to the there's the good and the bad. He makes the sun shine on both. And yet he himself doesn't compromise. He's still the God of truth. He's still the God of holiness. And uh, he doesn't change. While he's being fair to people, he's loving and compassionate to people, yet the truth is unchanged. So that's our approach with people. You know, we need to love and to be compassionate. We need to work with them without compromising on the truth given to us in scripture. All right, so hopefully this, you know, going through this course has uh, opened uh, our understanding to uh, the fact that, you know, we don't have to be afraid of questions. Uh, we can take the time and the effort to research, to learn, to study, and respond to the questions that people have um, without, of course, getting into arguments and fights and you know, those kinds of things, no. That we do everything in love uh, with the intent that, uh, you know, hopefully people will understand and be able to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So we are just helping them in this process, in this journey. Um, ultimately, it's God who has to work in their hearts and minds uh, and bring them to a place of conviction. What we can do is... Uh, sincerely do the best we can uh, to answer their questions, to understand where they're coming from, uh, to, uh, to, you know, to explain scripture in a way that would be relevant to situations that we are faced with. Okay, so um, that's the course. And um, we will, I'm still working on the assignments for all my courses. So I will put out these assignments. Uh, my plan is to put them all out by tomorrow. So if, uh, put out assignments for all my courses by tomorrow evening. Uh, they're not going to be very difficult. Just an hour of your time, you'll finish up the answering the questions. Uh, but that we will be done with this course. Uh, take, time, take, take time to study further on things that would be of interest to you. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying we can be experts on every topic. But there may be topics that might be interest of interest to you. Take time to study, research that further. And uh, if you have if you have any further questions, you're welcome to always email, and I will do my best to um, you know reply to your emails. So, what I want to do now is just to leave this time for any other questions. You know, this is just a, a time for interaction, where uh, if there are topics or themes or questions uh, that you feel uh, we can discuss, which would be useful, uh, please feel free to yeah, ask or put it in the chat. Okay. Go ahead, Sri Kumar. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, um, thank you. Uh, 
Pastor, I want to know um, in the book of John, as you said that uh, the in the uh, in the from the Genesis as the uh, like the um, the time and the um, energy energy is compressed together. And um, now uh, two things I want to know. Uh, when we read uh, the John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says that in the beginning was the word. So is it means that, uh, that the time and the energy was compressed in the word? And second thing I want to know, that when the Bible says um, uh, in the John chapter 1, verse 3, uh, not 3, in the four, in him was the life and the light. So, when the if the word was there in the beginning and everything was compressed in him, so the light and the life was there in the word. So, in that case, in the Genesis chapter one and verse two says that the earth was engulfed in darkness. And um, now it's not saying that the heaven was engulfed; it is only saying that the earth was engulfed. So, my question is. When the uh, when everything when the light was there, then um, everything was in the in the uh, if it is in the word or it was compressed with the word or if the word is the light and the life as you said or uh, uh, as the Bible says then how this darkness uh, appeared over the surface of the earth. So two things I want to know that when we say that it is compressed, is it compressed in the in the word? And second thing. If the law, if the if the word was the light and the life, then how the earth was engulfed in darkness? Then uh, I just want to know that. Thank you, Pastor. Good question. So uh, a, a, a way to understand this is to go back in time when there was only one realm, the spiritual realm. So in the beginning. At this, at, let's say before the beginning, beginning means the start of time. So before time started, or we use the phrase the dateless past, there was only one realm, which was the spiritual realm. So the natural realm was not there. So the spiritual realm, God was or God is, and that realm was a realm uh, with, you know, there was always light. God is light. So that's the spiritual realm. And then there was a point when out of the spiritual realm came the natural realm. The natural realm is what you and I live in. It's this entire universe or expanse of universe that we, that to our best understanding, if, you know, if, and we say it's vast, it's expansive, but that's all the natural realm. So this darkness the Genesis is talking about is in the natural realm, not in the spiritual realm, right? So in the natural realm, so in the spiritual realm, it was all light, God is, God was light. But then the natural realm came out of the spiritual realm. How did the natural realm come? It came through the spoken word, right? By the word of the Lord were the heavens. This heavens means the atmospheric heavens, the natural heavens, not the spiritual heavens. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Or Hebrews 11, that was Psalm 33, verse 6 and 9. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the heavens, this is the atmospheric heavens or the, the natural heavens. By faith we understand that the heavens were framed by the word of God. And... Um, and all, uh, so that the things which are were made of things that are not visible. So the natural realm came out of the spiritual realm and it was the spoken word of God that caused everything to come into existence. So through the word, God's design, that's God's wisdom, God's intelligence, God's design, God's power, which is all of his energy and was released and the natural world came into existence and then in the natural world we have these things like light uh, being formed and so on 
So when we talk about the uh, the in Genesis one to the earth being in darkness, that's the earth was created, but then we know that uh, you know the 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 stars, the celestial bodies that emit light, were then created subsequently, right? The uh, the stars, and the sun, and the stars, which emit light. So at that point, the physical earth was in darkness. So we, we, we should draw the distinction between the spiritual realm and the natural realm. And this is a process where God, who is spirit, who is eternally in the spiritual realm, is now creating, bringing into existence the natural realm. And then that's the process we see in Genesis 1. Uh, did I address all your questions? Uh, yeah, I have one more question uh, connected with that. So uh, it means that when the Bible says in the Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where the Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens. So is it mean that God created the, uh, the, the atmospheric heaven or it is the heaven where the Bible, uh, like how the John visited the heaven and he saw the heavenly beings and... Uh, where the God was enthroned, uh, is he saying about that that place? Is it a location or is it, uh, so as you said, it's an atmospheric um, uh, or it's atmospheric? Yeah. I just mm. want to know what it means that atmospheric. Sorry, the atmospheric it's means a location or it's a location. I uh, let's say uh, we're talking about the universe. We can use the word universe, right? In the, when you okay, when you say universe, it means galaxies and other things. The physical heavens. Okay, so is it also a location where the God dwells? Is it is it means that also? Yeah, so the word heaven in scripture or heavens, uh, sometimes it's used as a place where God dwells. Where does God dwell? He dwells in heaven. But even the physical earth, uh, the physical realm, which, for example, where the clouds are, you know, as high as the heavens are above the earth. So what's he talking about? Okay. The physical realm, right? The sky, as I said, or, you know, your faithfulness reaches to the heavens. Basically, he's, he's using the natural realm, the natural heavens, uh, as metaphors or pictures to describe something about God, right? Or, or, um, uh, or you know, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows his handiwork. What's he talking about? He's talking about the celestial heavens, the stars, the, the you know the universe that we talk about. So it's talking about the natural realm. But the word heaven or heavens also is used to talk about the place where God dwells, which that is in the spiritual realm, right? So God dwells in in the spiritual heavens. So now, and then again, you know, uh, uh, and. Paul says he's been caught up to the third heavens. What's he talking about? He's talking about the spiritual heavens. And he talks about we are wrestling with, uh, or we are seated in the heavenly places, spiritual. We are wrestling with powers of darkness in the heavenly, spiritual. But then we have to understand, so while in our minds we're demarcating spiritual and natural, we must also understand that the spiritual overlaps the natural. Because, for example, right now I'm sitting in this room, and in this room, there are two realms. There is the natural realm, but there is also the spiritual realm. Yes. Right? So I'm in this room. You, you, what you're seeing is the natural, but there are angels in this room. Right. Yes. So that's the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm overlaps the natural. It's almost like interwoven mm -hmm. into the natural, but yet in our minds, we demarcate them for the sake of understanding. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Maggie, your question, please. Thank you, sir. Um, based on, on uh, Brother Shikumar question, I think it was Brother Shikumar. So when when the in the revelation when it says that the heaven and the earth will be uh, folded and thrown away so, so that the new heaven and new earth will come. Does it mean it means it's saying about the physical heavens, about the, the, the universe? Because in heaven, Jesus went and 
explain the temple of his own blood. Mm. So for for the heaven where God lives to to pass, that means it's like the blood blood of Christ will have done. Uh, I don't know if it's the right word to use because it's not worth it to take the blood of Christ to go to heaven and clean the temple, then throw it away. So my question is, when it says the heaven and there will be a new heaven and new earth, does it mean the physical uh, space, like the, our universe? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, so, answer your, uh, so Mangi, the answer to your question is it's referring to the physical realm. Okay. So Second Peter three, where Peter describes, you know, that the heavens and the earth will be done away with, will melt, will be destroyed with the fire. So he's talking about the physical. And there'll be new heavens and a new earth. He's talking about the physical. Second Peter three. And then Revelation twenty one opens with that scene of a new heavens and the new earth physical. Now, how much of the physical heavens is God going to do with or renovate? We don't know. Other than what we can see written for us in Revelation 21 and 22, where he says the earth, the new earth, will not need a sun because what will happen is the spiritual heavens, the place where God dwells, will come into the natural realm. So we see that in Revelation 21, 22, where the heavens actually descend into the spiritual heavens, which is the tabernacle of God, which is made of a spiritual material. So when we say spiritual realm, it doesn't mean it's non-existent. No, it's just a spiritual material. And that is now coming down to rest upon physical earth. Okay, that's Revelation 21. And then he says in Revelation 21, the earth will no more need its sun because the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself, will be the sun here. So now there is the, the merging of the spiritual and the physical in a way that we have never experienced or cannot, have not, just cannot fathom because the spiritual, the spiritual material is now coming into the physical, what we refer to as physical earth. And uh, uh, Revelation 21, 22 captures that for us. And uh, so to answer your question, the old heavens and the earth, meaning the physical realm, will be done away with. Is it going to be the whole entire universe, which for God is just a measure with a span? Or is it going to be part of it? We don't know. It just says heavens and the earth. I'm assuming all of it. I'm just assuming, although we don't know for sure, you know what God's going to decide. I'm assuming that all of the physical realm will be renovated, made brand new, and heavens, that is a spiritual, comes in and meets the natural. And that's what the eternity future is going to be like, Revelation 21 and 22. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, go ahead, Tessa. Um, the, the reference of the different heavens, like the celestial heavens, the physical, I think, how many references to heavens in terms of um, that you mentioned? How do you know how to interpret which one? Um, the, the Bible is talking about the giving a key point, which is okay, this is the heavens talking about the physical heaven, and this is whichever heaven is talking about? Mm, is there yeah. a way to, um, to pick it up in, based on the verses or uh, interpretation? How do you interpret one interpret which heaven? And what are the different um, heavens? Because when they said, okay, this is another question, open heaven, what exactly is open heaven? We understand in some sense that it's some uh, where you have access, you know, in terms of favor, etc. But what exactly, when we're saying open heaven, is we are really saying? Okay, okay. So, yeah. So the first part of your question: How do we know what heavens or which heavens is being referred to? 
uh, of course, uh, we will have to go by the context. And uh, a simple rule of thumb is if God is involved or spirit beings are involved, like angels or demons, then we know it's talking about the spiritual heavens, right? Uh, because then it's it's the spiritual realm because it's in that realm God lives and these spiritual beings operate. So, uh, so that's that's kind of a rule of thumb that we use to you know okay. When Paul says, you know, I was caught up to the third heavens where I heard, you know, God speak, I heard inexpressible things. Well, then it has to be the spiritual realm uh, and not the uh, the celestial heavens so or the the uh, the universe as such. Or uh, so that's one rule of thumb. Second is sometimes it's explicitly stated. For instance, in First Corinthians fifteen, when Paul talks about the terrestrial and the celestial. Then he's, got, he's just talking about you know things on earth and things in heaven, meaning the heavenly bodies, the universe. So there it's kind of explicit. He states things that way. So you know he's talking when he's talking about those kinds of bodies. He's actually talking about the natural universe uh, and about um, things that exist there. But then in that passage, he also talks about the heavenly man. Then obviously he's talking about Jesus. He refers to Jesus as the heavenly man. So this is the Lord from heaven. When he says the Lord from heaven, he's talking not talking about heaven as in the natural heaven, but the Lord from heaven, meaning the Lord who came from the spiritual heavens, right? So, you know, so the context, and then who's who's he speaking about? If he's talking about God, angelic beings, spiritual beings, then spiritual heavens. Be talking about the earth, earth-related things, then, yeah, or uh, you know, natural heaven bodies. Then it's the natural heaven. So that's how, from the context, we can determine what heavens is being addressed. Now, in scripture, uh, as far as the spiritual heavens are concerned, Paul uses the term third heavens. So that means, and this is in spiritual context, that means there has to be a oh, first heaven and a second heaven and a third heaven. And uh, and then we know that, you know, we are wrestling against principalities, powers in the heavenly places. That's the spiritual realm. So it seems to imply that in the spiritual heavens, there are these three levels, you know, because Paul was caught up to the third heavens. Now, uh, the Bible doesn't explicitly state what the first heavens are or the second heavens are. It doesn't explicitly state it. And therefore, what is you know, commonly understood, especially in the charismatic circles, may not be in evangelical circles, but in charismatic Pentecostal type circles, what the first and the second heavens are usually interpreted to be as the first heavens is the the spiritual atmosphere surrounding the earth, where de you know where we are engaged and we deal with demonic spirits. The second heavens is the next level of spiritual atmosphere where Satan and his demons operate, and the third heavens is the third level where God is, God dwells. Okay. Now, evangelicals may not agree with this, but this is typically what is understood in the charismatic Pentecostal circles of the first and second and the third heavens. Uh, and which, to my understanding, uh, even though the Bible doesn't explicitly state it, uh, I, I'm comfortable with that, that the first heavens refers to the spiritual atmosphere enveloping the earth, where we, you know, where we spiritually operate as well. Second is where demons, there are principally powers, Satan's demonic hierarchy operates. Third is where God dwells. Um, so I think that answers both your questions, Daisha. Yes, sir. Um, it answers, but about the open heaven. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. That let first me, one. Okay, let me explain that. Yeah, so open heavens is just 
uh, a terminology, and again, it's mainly in the charismatic Pentecostal spiritual circles. Uh, uh, it's based on certain scriptures, like uh, in the New Testament, we see in Matthew 3, uh, in the baptism of Jesus, it says, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit came like a dove. Or when Stephen was being stoned in Acts 5, he says, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing. Or in the prophet is in the Old Testament, when Ezekiel's experiences, he says, you know, the heavens were opened and a hand reached out to me. So in, uh, in, in the book of Ezekiel also, we have this term or the phrase, the heavens being opened, open heavens. So it's taken from these, you know, these references is based on that. And so we use, we, you know, we use this term open heavens. And uh, basically it refers to um, a place uh, where, uh, uh, so it's referring to that. Uh, so, so the idea here is, the idea behind this whole thing is, so we are operating, now think in the spiritual realms, that, you know, we are operating in the first heavens, that means the spiritual realm immediately envelop, enveloping the earth. It's a spiritual atmosphere around the earth. Then there is the second heavens where the demonic powers are operating. So the idea behind all of this is, and then there's the third heavens where God dwells. So when Stephen says, I see the heavens opened, that means he is saying like, you know, this, this, this atmosphere, spiritual atmosphere, the first level, second level is just opened. And I can see directly into the third heavens where God is. Or when Ezekiel has his experiences, uh, or when Jesus being baptized, the heavens were opened. So it's not about talking about the natural, but the spiritual and the Holy Spirit descending. So open heavens is a term that's used to say that the first and the second spiritual at atmospheres are so opened, or in some ways you could say the demonic interference is so weakened or so less that it's like easy access into to God or God is uh, therefore working out or pouring out his grace and his blessing. So that's how the term open heavens is understood or is used. And again, this is very specific to charismatic Pentecostal spiritual circles. Um, so what, what the implication is therefore in regions where there are open heavens, so to speak, um, there is free access, like in, in Jacob's experience, he calls it uh, a gateway to heaven. The heavens, you know, in his dream, he has this. He sees a stairway to heaven, a gateway to heaven. That means there's a free access, a movement between the third heavens to our world, either a revelation, the works of God, and so on. And often it is used in the relation of revival, right? That means when, when, when we are experiencing an unusual move of God here on earth, we say there's an open heavens in this area, in this region, uh, and is often used in the, in, the, say, in, in the context of revival. When revival is happening, we are saying, you know, God is moving so freely, and that's how it is used. Does that help, or did I confuse you? Is that okay? You, Pastor. Pastor. Yes, yes, Pastor. Thank you. I'm clear. Okay. Appreciate it. Good. Um, it's kind of interesting in the Christian world how a certain terminologies are used in certain circles, you know. So you know, there are certain terminologies that are, you know, when you know, it's more prevalent in spirit-filled, charismatic type of circles. Then when you look at the evangelical world, you know, uh, the Baptist, um, Methodist, Reformed, so on, they have their own language uh, to speak and express doctrine and ideas and theology. So it's interesting. It's just good to be familiar with both and so that we can, you know, understand what people are saying. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so I see Rose, Rose question. Uh, Pastor, can you please shed light on the following sequence of events when Jesus died on the cross and he went down to the depths. He preached to the spirits and he ascended back. He took the righteous ones with him. Uh, and when he went up to heaven in these events, then to be placed the time when he said to Mary not to touch him because he ascended to his, he had not yet ascended to the Father. So when you look at the sequence of events from the cross uh, till Christ's uh, eventual ascension to heaven. So the ascension actually happened in two stages. The actual final ascension happened, uh, uh, that's in Acts 1. But let's pick up. So when Jesus died on the cross, uh, when he died on the cross, that same day he went into paradise. Now remember, before the cross, paradise was in the lower parts of the earth. So in the lower parts of the earth, there were two compartments. Um, uh, there was hell, and then there was Abraham's bosom, or paradise. So uh, uh, Jesus went down into paradise. The, the thief who died with Jesus was also crucified. He went to paradise. So Jesus was there in paradise. It's quite possible that he went across and preached to the spirits that were held in hell, or he proclaimed to them that redemption has been done. You know, we read about that. Then he ascended on the third day. So, you know, for our, for on, on Sunday morning, okay, he ascended, he came out of the grave physically, he arose. So when he physically arose, that day, on that the day of resurrection, he was still here on earth. And then that's when, when Mary saw him. She thought he was the gardener. So she, when she came to the tomb, he, she thought it, he was a gardener. And then she realized, no, this is the physically, the resurrected Lord. But remember, he, he was in the spiritual body, a, 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 a glorified body, different from his physical body, right? And that's when he said, so on the day of his resurrection, he told Mary, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. Right? So he was resurrected, but he had not yet ascended. So he said, don't touch me. Then comes the ascension, but this ascension has a twofold purpose. Um, he goes to the Father, which uh, according to Hebrews 10, he ascends to take his own blood into the most holy place. That means he's going before the Father saying, the work has been done. So he ascends. And this also is a fulfillment of Ephesians 4. When, when he ascended, he led captivity captive. So that means Abraham's bosom, all the Old Testament saints were held in Abraham's bosom up until that time. Paradise was taken and was shifted into heaven. So two scriptures, right? Hebrews 10, Ephesians 4. So when he ascended at that time, that is the day, maybe later on in the day of resurrection, right? he ascended, what happened? Two things. He was taking his own blood into the most holy place and he was leading captivity captive. Paradise was being shifted into heaven. So having done that, what did he do? For the next 40 days, this is Acts 1, verse 1 and 2. For the next 40 days, he showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. So that means he had not permanently ascended. He was still visiting people here on earth. He was making his physical appearances. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and we have the record of many of his disciples seeing him. And then finally, at the end of the 40 days, Acts chapter 1, is his ascension from the Mount of Olives in the eyes of all his uh, disciples who saw him. And that's when the two angels announced saying, this same Jesus whom you've seen him go will come in so like manner, will, so come, will come in so like manner as you've seen him ascend. So that was his ascension. That's why I said the ascension was in two parts. The first was on the day of resurrection when he took his own blood and led captivity captive. The final one was 
Acts chapter 1, at the end of the 40-day period, from the Mount of Olives, he ascended and, you know, to be seated at the right hand of the Father. And, um, yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's kind of the sequence of uh, events, yeah. Is that okay, Rose? Okay. Good. So, any other questions? All right, so we have Tesha and Samuel. Good. So, uh, shall we take a break and come back and take those questions then? So we can go into our second hour. Can we do that? Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So let's do this. Let's take our 10 minute break. I will come right back and then we'll get into our questions, further questions in the second hour. Anybody you can add any questions, uh, you're welcome to ask. We can discuss these things, you know, common questions. Then we will make use of our second hour as well. Okay. To Samuel Tesha, if um, yeah, if you have questions, you know, we will take your questions right after this 10 minute break. Okay. See you all soon. Thank you.